Hey guys, welcome to week five. Um, we are going to be starting a new book unit that should last about two weeks because the story we're looking at is a short story. Um, it is Fahrenheit 451 by Ray Bradbury. And um, I haven't taught this book yet. I did a lot of research um, to try to see something that would be kind of accessible in this kind of learning context that didn't need a lot of extra supplemental aid or assistance. Um, typically I would read um, 1984 or some other dystopian novel at this point in the semester because um, we'll talk a little bit in a second about just sort of again that timeline of American history. But in general, I think that this book really does fit with our timeline and it is generally easy to understand and read. I read it in a couple of hours um, again the other day. So you should enjoy it. Um, there's a lot here to kind of access and play with and understand. So um, let's look at some of the background and then I'll kind of help you understand how this fits into the context of what was going on in the world at the time and how this was sort of a natural um, response to a lot of um, historical events and then also that literary trend, you know, picking up after the um, the lost generation of World War One, and then we had the Great Gatsby, which was kind of born during that season. Um, the stock market crash, the the Great Depression, and then obviously World War Two, put a halt um, for the most part on literary production. A lot of things were not being written during that time period of about 1930 till approximately 1940, 1945. Now. A lot of the same writers from the last generation did produce works during this time. So you're going to see like Hemingway, Faulkner, um, and of course, not American writers, but other authors um, would write things that were more kind of futuristic, looking at a response to some of the, the tragedy that they had gone through. Um, and then kind of the flip side of that was sort of what did it look like on the home front and so there are a few books so like John Steinbeck um we read of Mice and Men last year there's also plenty of other books he wrote The Pearl I think you guys read that in ninth grade um and then he also wrote um The Grapes of Wrath which is a really long slogging book talking about people here during the Great Depression trying to find work on farms and um while there is great merit in Steinbeck's work, I don't think it's the best thing to kind of process through or learn from when we're away from the classroom, just because it can be um, a grueling task to get through his work because it is so descriptive. And so what we're going to do is we're going to skip over that period of the 1930s um, and we're moving to the 1940s. And so when we read Animal Farm last year, I need you guys to kind of think back to what was going on. In the Russian Revolution, what was going on during communism? We had censorship, we had um, a lot of the proletariat, which is kind of just like your your general population, being completely um, destroyed and their thinking capacity being rerouted um, due to like things like Hitler's um, youth camps or massive censorship and fear that was widespread among um, families and we talked about how like children were reporting on parents and there was sort of this sense that the government is watching um, they did away with school and education except for indoctrinating people in the ideologies and theories that they wanted to serve their kind of communist agenda and so the Western world at that time the free thinking world the world that valued individualism and um, like creativity and um, intellect was really kind of shocked and frightened to see masses and masses of people's um, thinking capacity just stymied or cut cut short and they weren't able to or free to exercise their human potential or human right to think and participate in ideas or to ask questions. And so really that's the background um, into which books like Fahrenheit 451 enter. Also, like I said, so we have Camus the Stranger. We also have um, other books like um, Alexander Solzhenitsyn. And um, these were 
more continental, like European writers or um, Eastern Europe, they were kind of exploring these themes as well. But again, this is American literature, so we really want to stick to what were people thinking in America. And so therefore, um, Ray Bradbury's novel is a great choice. So let's get into it. Um, it is called, of course, Fahrenheit 451. And some people wonder, well, what does that mean? That is the temperature at which book paper catches fire and burns. Um, and books at the time were really thick. And so it had to be very hot. And um, so it began in 1947 as something like it was a draft that he wrote and he called it Bright Phoenix. Um, it wasn't a fully completed work in 1951. Instead, he called it The Fireman, and it, it was a shorter version of the story published in a Galaxy mag magazine. But then he expanded it in 1953 to call it Fahrenheit 451. It became a novel. And this was written at a time when the world was threatened by nuclear war. There were new technologies emerging. The world was getting smaller due to technology. And um, really his ability to sort of predict where things were going is fairly uncanny. And people remark on that like, wow, he foresaw this before it even happened. So I want you to kind of look for those things. Um, at the time, con uh, these are some concepts related to 400 Fahrenheit 451. Social criticism is a mode of criticism that addresses malicious conditions in a society considered to be flawed and it aims at practical solutions. So that's kind of a mouthful. What does that mean? Um, essentially, what it does is it looks at society as a whole and it says, okay, where are there flaws in society that need to be corrected? So someone might look at an issue of prejudice or racism or um, economic disparity between the rich and the poor. You might look at some type of a social circumstance and say, hmm, let's address that. And so what he's doing is he is writing a piece where he's finding things in the society at the time and saying, I'm not okay with that. There's a problem here and something needs to be done. So it warns against the dangers of suppressing thoughts and ideas through censorship. Um, it is a piece of science fiction. So it's a form of fantasy in this genre um, in which scientific facts, assumptions, and hypotheses form the basis of adventure in the future, on other planets and other dimensions in time, or under new variants of a scientific law. Um, so while this is classified in some cases as science fiction, it really isn't um, fully a science fiction novel in that it um, defies laws of nature, gravity, that sort of thing. Um, or scientific principles. Really what it is, is it's more of just sort of a futuristic um, projection. If we keep on this trajectory as a society, if we continue to do these certain things, where will we be? Um, Fahrenheit 451 conveys a message that oppressive governments left unchecked can do irreparable damage to society by limiting the creativity and freedom of its people. Um, Absolutely, this was seen in communist Russia and other communist um, regimes, territories, um, where that that type of um, groupthink mentality came in and absolutely like damaged society. Truly, they burned books. Um, that was sort of a, pop a popular spectacle. Um, in this totalitarian society, there was a centrally controlled autocratic leader that had strict control of all aspects of life and subordination of the individual to the state. So in other words, democ in a democracy, in theory at least, we all have individual rights and power over governing our own lives, making our own decisions. Totalitarian societies do not have this privilege. It's a society that must, under every circumstance, abide by what some type of a, an all-powerful leader dictates or says needs to be done. And then he has his little pawns um, that go and carry out his orders. So again, if we were using Animal Farm, for instance, or the Russian Revolution, you have the Tsar um, that was later replaced by the dictator Stalin, and then all of the um, secret police, the KGB, the, the pigs in Animal Farm, that would um, go out and do the work of the all-powerful ruler. Um, it's also a dystopian society. So this is an imagined place or a state in which everything is unpleasant or bad, even though they think they seem to think that it's not based on the widespread dissemination of propaganda. It's used to control citizens. Information, independent thought, and freedom are restricted. 
um, this is kind of a big one for this book, that people do not have access to information, they cannot think for themselves, and <clears throat> their freedoms to do these things are severely restricted. There's a figurehead or a concept that is worshipped by citizens. Again, it's a little bit less clear in this book who the government is. In 1984, obviously it's Big Brother. In Brave New World, um, you have <clears throat> the, the creator um, or the one who, whose idea all of this was. But again, they're just sort of a figurehead. Um, and in this case, it's more of a concept that's worshipped by citizens, and the concept is happiness. Um, citizens are going to feel trapped, and they're going to struggle to escape. Um, the natural world begins to be banished and distrusted. Citizens are dehumanized. The society is in an illusion of a perfect utopian world. So even though we would call it dystopian or um, unpleasant or bad, the people who are in that society don't recognize that it's oppressive and bad. Um, all right, so we're going to look a little bit at the historical context of what was happening in, in the world of the 1950s. Well, World War, II, world War II had ended just a few years earlier, and as we know, um, the aftermath of that, it kind of just seamlessly turned into um, the Vietnam War and the Cold War era, um, because even though the war was over, the communist regimes were still very alive and powerful and well, particularly in Eastern Europe, and that threat was looming over the rest of the world. Um, nuclear warfare loomed more jobs led to Americans having more discretionary income. It led to an increased passivity and conformity in the age of follow orders and you will succeed. Um, in other words, there was a lot of materialism and money and people wanting to make their lives better economically, socially. And um, the era of McCarthyism brought new vigor to Truman's hunt for communist infiltrators. Technology and electronics expanded, including the use of televised surveillance footage um, using used for many purposes to condemn and inform through sound bites. And illiteracy was growing. A lot of people had not been educated during the war period, and so um, the value of education was going down. There were lasting effects from World War II. During Hitler's power reign, he burned many books. The Soviet Union banned and burned books. Communist China burned books. Um, the novel condemns this anti-intellectualism in kind of a roundabout way. Um, there's a threat of nuclear war, so obviously um, there was nuclear um, weaponry used during World War II, and so bomb shelters were built, warning systems were infiltrated, drills in public school were practiced. Um, consumerism was on the rise. Americans were seeing success. 60% of Americans were now in the middle class. It became an automobile culture. People were buying cars. Prosperity increased due to plentiful jobs. And with that um, mass marketing and conformity where people started to have what everybody else had or look the same way everybody else looked. Um, we are going to um, look into this theme a little bit um, of McCarthyism and the Cold War era. So um, Joseph McCarthy was a senator in the United States, and he took advantage of the fear and distrust about the spread of communism in contrast to America's democracy. So he and his committee basically um, conducted what the, many scholars call a modern day witch hunt, where they would accuse random people of being communist disloyal, and they were subverting the government, and they were committing acts of treason, and they were spreading hate propaganda without proper evidence. And so as a result, many people were questioned, and the integrity of the government and its power um, were put into question, and they infiltrated people's private lives. And so even though we think of America as being really above sort of these tactics of um, fear-mongering and government infiltration of private lives, it really was alive during this period, and Ray Bradbury said some nights, when the wind is right, the future smells of kerosene, and that was written in the book. So in other words, um, you don't know when the government's coming for you. You don't know who's going to accuse you and when that might um, come to be. So again, the television was extremely prominent. It was um, being widely disseminated. Some of these statistics are really important for us to look at simply because the television plays a big role in the book as well. So um, I'm going to pause it here and then we'll continue the background in the next um, presentation.